Thanks. Uh, and thanks for having me uh, to talk. Uh, so everything in this talk is joint work with Laura and Jesus. Um, and some of it is also joint work with Alex, who spoke just before me about uh, the other half of the, uh, the paper that we worked on together. Okay, so uh, this talk is primarily motivated, uh, as a lot of optimization talks are, by hoping to better understand the, uh, the performance and the behavior of the simplex method, uh, and in particular, in the setting of zero one LPs. Um, and for the purposes of doing that, we, you know, we have a lot of things that we can do. Um, and one of those things is to uh, abstract what it does and, and generalize what it does. Um, as we've discussed already uh, today, um, one of the most popular abstractions of what the simplex method does is to look at the diameter of polyhedra. Um, so as, as has been discussed by Daniel and Alex already today, um, given a polyhedron, we can naturally associate uh, a graph whose vertices and edges are exactly the vertices and edges of the polyhedron itself. And the combinatorial diameter of a polyhedron is the maximum value of a shortest path between any pair of vertices on this graph. And of course, this is related to the behavior of the simplex method because as we know, the simplex method traces out a path on this graph. Uh, and if we want to have uh, some indirect uh, way of understanding how many pivots the simplex method might take, um, we, we glean some information by knowing how long these paths can possibly be. Uh, we can further enrich this notion um, by giving it a linear function, uh, as has the simplex method. Um, and then we can study the monotone diameter, uh, which is the max maximum value of the shortest monotone path from any vertex to the C maximum, where uh, our steps have to strictly increase this objective function. Uh, so, um, as has also been discussed today, uh, the most famous conjecture in this realm is, was the Hirsch conjecture. Uh, which stated that uh, the diameter of an n-dimensional polyhedron with m facets is at most m minus n. And this was um, believed to be true for a long time, and uh, it was shown to be true for a lot of nice classes of polyhedra. It was first disproved for unbounded ones by Klee and Walkup like 10 years after it was proposed, uh, and it took a very long time for it to be disproved in general uh, in 2012. Um, but uh, it was proved to be true for zero one polytopes, um, which is the, uh, the topic of this talk. Uh, importantly, the polynomial version of this question is still open. So is there uh, some polynomial function of M and N that bounds the combinatorial diameter? So another question you can ask in light of the fact that the Hirsch conjecture is false is whether it does hold for some generalized notion of diameter. Uh, and so in 2014, Borgwart, Finhold, and Hemicke uh, formalized the notion of the circuit diameter, which is a notion of diameter where we expand the set of uh, directions that we're allowed to move. In particular, uh, at each step, we're going to be allowed to move along the set of uh, so-called circuits of the polyhedron. Um, and uh, there's a number of equivalent definitions of the circuits, but to see that this generalizes um, moving along edges, uh, the definition I'll give here is that the circuits are given uh, as the set of all potential edge directions that arise um, by potentially translating the facets of the polyhedron. So given a polyhedron, all of its edges, uh, all its edge directions are circuits. But if I then translate the facets of that polyhedron around, any direction that shows up as an edge direction uh, is also a circuit of the original polyhedron. Um, there is like an algebraic definition of circuits that are useful for actually working with them, um, but I don't have the time to get into it here. But the crux of that definition, uh, another way to think of the circuits, are that they're the set of directions that are parallel to as many facets of the polyhedron as possible. And so what's the circuit diameter? Well, the circuit diameter is the maximum value of a shortest path between any two extreme points, assuming that at any given point, um, we can move along any circuit direction, so including through the interior of the polyhedron. Um, but once we pick a direction, we have to move as far in that direction as possible. So we move until we hit the boundary. So for example, uh, on this polygon in the combinatorial setting, if we were at this vertex down here, we could only move along the two incident edges. But in the circuit setting, we have a third option. We can move in this direction because this direction is, is parallel to an edge direction of the polygon. So here's an example of a circuit path that isn't a combinatorial path. 
So we can move all the way through the interior until we hit this facet, and then we can uh, move to this vertex here. And one of the reasons you might study the circuit diameter is because the circuit diameter of a polyhedron gives a lower bound on the combinatorial diameter of that polyhedron. Um, now, although uh, the notion of the circuit diameter is relatively recent, um, the notion of the circuits uh, is not a relatively recent notation. It has a long history of being relevant uh, and used in optimization. Um, so uh, one example is that we can uh, imagine the possibility of having an augmentation algorithm for solving linear programs uh, based on the idea of uh, augmenting our current feasible solution along a circuit direction. So if we want to solve an LP uh, just in the uh, generic form, um, Jesus and his co-authors uh, Raymond Hemke and John Lee proposed uh, some augmentation algorithms for LPs that are based on circuits. Um, and at each step, they uh, select an improving circuit. Uh, so that is one that increases the objective function and can be applied with a non-zero step length. And they move maximally along that direction inside the feasible region. And they iterate this until they reach an optimal solution. Uh, but just like the simplex method requires a pivot rule to decide which basis exchange to take, um, a circuit augmentation algorithm requires some way of deciding which improving circuit it should, uh, it should use. So they propose another of uh, you know, so-called circuit pivot rules. The two that are most relevant to this talk are the uh, greatest improvement rule, which does exactly what it says it does. It, uh, it, it, it selects as its circuit step the one that yields the greatest possible improvement um, in the objective function over all possible circuit steps. And they also propose the steepest descent circuit pivot rule, uh, which selects the circuit uh, G that maximizes its cost divided by its one norm. Um, and, and throughout this talk, anytime we're talking about steepness, so steepest descent or uh, steepest edges, um, here we're talking about normalizing with respect to the one norm instead of the usual two norm. Um, so what they show in their paper when they propose these rules uh, is that the greatest improvement rule requires only a polynomial number of circuit augmentations in order to reach an optimal solution. Although perhaps unsurprisingly, we later show that computing the greatest improvement rule is NP hard. Um, and they also show that the steepest descent rule requires a number of steps, which is at most the number of circuits of the, uh, of the feasible region, or, or more precisely, the number of circuits of the, um, uh, the linear description. Um, now this bound, uh, the number of circuits, is exponential in general, and it's kind of opaque and hard to analyze or understand. So in follow-up work, uh, we uh, sought to make that bound a little more digestible and improve it. So what Laura and Jesus and I show uh, is that if we have an LP with a bounded feasible region and we're at a vertex of that feasible region, then the steepest descent circuit step is an approximation of the greatest improvement step. Uh, and in particular, the approximation ratio is omega one over M one where omega one is the minimum one norm distance from any vertex to any facet not containing that vertex. And M1 is the maximum one norm distance between any two vertices. And the way that we can leverage this, um, this approximation fact is that uh, uh, we can get a bound on the number of steps required. So starting from any initial vertex solution X zero, uh, the steepest descent circuit pivot rule um, can reach an optimal solution of an LP uh, and at most 2n squared m1 over omega 1 times this log factor number of steps. And in this log factor, delta here refers to the maximum absolute value of any subdeterminant of our uh, linear system. So this is also not polynomial in general, uh, but it is a much nicer bound than the previous known one. Um, and it is nice in special cases. And so that brings us into the uh, uh, 0, 1. Uh, LPs. So in the zero one setting, um, we're in a, a nice case where M1 over omega one is at most N. Uh, and further furthermore, we can ignore this term delta. Um, and this is because the feasible region is integral. Uh, all the vertices uh, have integer coordinates. So it, the, the point in the analysis where this delta shows up, we can just skip it. Um, so that already makes this bound um, much, much nicer. And furthermore, we can leverage a uh, classical result of Frank and Tardish uh, to keep the infinity norm of C small, and, and, and that's going to control the size of this term. And in particular, uh, doing so will make this uh, 
uh, this bound strongly polynomial. So that's a nice result um, in the setting of, of circuits and circuit augmentation algorithms. But um, we are able to uh, determine um, some extra things uh, via our analysis. Uh, so uh, it's not too hard to see that the, the value of um, the cost over the one norm for a steepest descent step uh, is at most the optimal value of this LP. Um, so in this case, we are uh, optimizing instead of over all the circuits, we're optimizing over all possible directions, Z. And what do we want? We want that Z is a, a feasible direction at our current solution. So this says that Z is in the feasible cone at our current solution X. And we want that the one norm of Z is at most one. And I say this is an LP because both of these criteria um, are essentially saying that Z is in some polyhedron. So the feasible cone at X is a polyhedron. Um, and this is saying that Z is inside the one norm ball of radius one and the one norm ball of radius one is a, is a polytope as well. Um, but another thing that we notice is that uh, for zero one polytopes at a vertex, the entire feasible cone of that vertex is contained within a single orthent of space. Every entry of X is either uh, zero, it's minimum possible value, or one, it's maximum possible value. Uh, and if you're familiar with the one norm ball of radius one, uh, you know that uh, it has exponentially many constraints, one corresponding to each orthent of space. And so what we conclude is that we can model this criterion by just taking one of those constraints. So we can replace the one norm of Z is at most one by uh, instead saying that V transpose Z is at most one for just one choice of V. In particular, um, V is defined so that uh, VI is equal to one minus two times XI. So VI is equal to one if XI is zero and VI is equal to negative one if XI is equal to one. And uh, the, the key important takeaway of this fact is that we can then conclude that the optimal solution to this LP corresponds uh, not just to an arbitrary direction at X and not just to a circuit direction at X, but actually to an edge, an edge direction at X. Um, and to see that, um, you know, we'll first, you know, suppose we're in the setting where X is not an optimal solution to our original LP, um, otherwise we're just done. Um, so uh, the zero vector is not an optimal solution uh, to this LP, that would correspond to not having to move and so this LP does have some um, optimal extreme point solution. That optimal extreme point solution is determined by um, n tight constraints. But at most one of those tight constraints um, is of this form. So in particular, n minus one of them uh, are given by constraints that are also tight at our current solution x. Uh, so that is to say, it, comes, it, it corresponds to an edge direction. So what does this tell us? Uh, well, first of all, since edges are circuits, uh, this tells us that, in fact, the optimal uh, solution to this LP is the steepest descent step. So the steepest descent step doesn't just have value bounded by the optimal value of this LP. It actually is the optimal solution to this LP. Um, but it tells us much more. Um, since steepest descent circuits are, in fact, steepest edges, Everything we know about the, uh, uh, the augmentation algorithm that we get from augmenting along steepest circuits is actually also a fact about um, the monotone path in our feasible region that's generated by steepest edges. In particular, um, you know, this bound carries through to that. So if we're given a 0, 1 LP and we're given any starting vertex, the monotone path in the feasible region given um, by taking uh, steepest edges, again, steepest normalized with the one norm, is of strongly polynomial length. Uh, Can I ask for, something? Sorry? Can I ask something? Absolutely. Question, question what, what do you mean by zero one LP? Do the vertices are zero one or do the constraints are zero one? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, the, the vertices are zero one. So it's an LP defined over a zero one polytope. It's specifically. Okay. Thank yeah, thank you. So uh, yes, given a zero one LP, um, this path on the one skeleton of uh, generated by um, steepest edges at each step is of strongly polynomial length. Uh, 
Um, and furthermore, this path can be computed in polynomial time. And this is simply because um, at each step, we compute the steepest edge. We can compute the steepest edge by solving that LP that I had on the previous slide. Now, of course, that's not a practical result from the per uh, perspective of actually solving LPs because we're implicitly solving an auxiliary LP as a subroutine. But I do think it's very interesting to know that um, you know, zero one LPs have these, uh, you know, very short monotone paths and that they aren't NP hard to compute and that they're generated by a simple, uh, simple rule of choosing each edge. And I do want to emphasize here that uh, achieving this result really did come from approaching this topic from the perspective of circuits. It was really, uh, you know, understanding the, the circuit augmentation algorithms and the circuit machinery that led us here. And so in that sense, um, although the circuits are sort of, you know, multiple uh, steps of abstraction away from uh, say the simplex method, um, they did prove extremely useful. Um, and speaking of the simplex method, uh, we do get, uh, you know, we do start to reel back in uh, the degree to which this applies to the simplex method. So we get a corollary from this that says if we're uh, given a non-degenerate 0, 1 LP, the simplex method with a steepest edge pivot rule reaches an optimal solution in strongly polynomial time. Um, and this is because in the non-degenerate setting, the pivot directions are precisely the edge directions. Uh, so it follows the same path. Um, now this is uh, you know, not extraordinarily interesting because um, there, uh, the, the set of non-degenerate 0, 1 LPs is actually quite restrictive. So a natural question is whether we can do this in general, so in the presence of degeneracy. Um, and it doesn't follow immediately. So in particular, um, uh, despite its name, uh, the uh, simplex method equipped with the steepest edge pivot rule in the presence of degeneracy does not necessarily follow the monotone path given by steepest edges. So it's somewhat a misnomer in that sense. So in particular, we have um, examples. We have an example in our paper um, that shows that it's possible for the simplex method with a steepest edge pivot rule uh, at a particular basis in the presence of degeneracy to perform a non-degenerate pivot. So corresponding to moving along an edge direction of our feasible region, but where that edge direction is not the steepest edge over all possible edge directions at that vertex. And of course, that isn't really surprising um, because uh, there could, in theory, be exponentially many edges incident to a particular vertex. Um, and the simplex method by design, of course, doesn't look over all possible edges it could move over. It only looks at, uh, you know, dimension many pivots at a time. And it, so it can only see the edges that are visible at a particular basis. Uh, so actually, a priori, one might assume that, uh, you know, the answer to this question is, is no, uh, that this would be really hard to do. Uh, this here being get the simplex method to follow the monotone path of steepest edges. But um, what we show is that we actually can do that. So we define a pivot rule for the simplex method, which we call the true steepest edge pivot rule um, that has precisely the property we want. That if uh, we run the simplex method with this pivot rule and we look at the path it traces on the one skeleton of the feasible region, it is exactly the monotone path uh, given by steepest edges. Um, and this is uh, related to an open question in the literature, uh, which asks whether there exists a simplex pivot rule that performs only strongly polynomial number or, or just polynomial number of non-degenerate pivots on 0, 1 LPs. And there is a partial answer to this question in the literature uh, by Kitahara and Misuno, which shows that this is true for the dancing pivot rule if you're given a 0, 1 LP in standard equality form. And although, of course, you can put any um, zero one feasible region into a quality form by adding slack variables, those slack variables might not necessarily take only zero one values. Um, so their result doesn't have anything to say about that. Um, now Stickler might say that, you know, technically uh, the simplex method when implemented only operates on zero one LPs in, in standard equality form. So perhaps the scope of this question is limited to zero one LPs in standard equality form. But of course it would be nice, it would be nice if uh, the answer to this question were yes uh, for any 0, 1 LP that you give me in general form, as long as in its original form, so before we add slack variables, before we construct a tableau, the feasible region is 0, 1. That would be nice. Uh, 
Uh, and that's exactly what our rule says. So because it follows uh, the path given by steepest edges, and because we know that path is of strongly polynomial length, uh, we get that the simplex method with a true steepest edge pivot rule reaches an optimal solution using only a strongly polynomial, num polynomial number of non-degenerate pivots, ignoring, of course, the, the degenerate ones. Okay, so what does this rule actually do? Uh, so since the, the intuition behind this rule and the behavior of this rule is really uh, dependent on the geometry of the original feasible region and not so much on what the standard equality form looks like or what the tableau looks like, I'm going to define it, perhaps somewhat informally, in terms of the geometry of the original feasible region. Um, but in our paper, we explain how this does correspond directly to something implemented on a tableau, so genuine implementable simplex pivot rule. Okay, so what does this rule do? So um, at, a, at a particular basis, it selects as a pivot direction, um, essentially the optimal solution to the, the following LP, where this is strikingly similar to the LP I had a couple slides ago, um, where really the only modification we've made is that we've replaced that we're optimizing over the feasible cone with uh, the fact that we're optimizing over the so-called basic cone. And what do I mean by that? So given, uh, given a basis you know, for, for the tableau, for this LP in standard equality form, uh, that naturally corresponds to a subset of the uh, constraints of our original LP that are tight at um, our current basic feasible solution, uh, our current extreme point solution. And so the basic corm cone is formed by just taking those tight constraints. So the feasible cone is formed by all constraints tight at our current solution. The basic cone is formed by just the subset of those that correspond to the basis. And whereas the extreme rays of the feasible cone correspond to the edges at a given uh, uh, vertex, the extreme rays of the basic cone correspond to the available pivot directions. And so uh, uh, what this is saying, uh, so that is to say um, I can define the pivot rule or at least partially define the pivot rule uh, by telling you if I'm, if I'm at a current basic cone, which of these extreme rays do I pick as my pivot direction? Uh, and so what this rule does is it picks the extreme ray that optimizes this. Now, unlike the previous LP, this actually could be unbounded. The basic cone is much broader. Um, but if this LP is unbounded, we select uh, the, any, any extreme ray uh, on which our objective function is unbounded uh, for this LP. Um, and, and so, but you know, Otherwise, this is uh, very, very similar to what we do in the edge case. Um, and I do want to stress again, we can implement this um, on a tableau. It isn't necessary to define it in terms of this Sean, LP. Sean, there is a question on the chat. What is okay. V? Uh, you have to oh, define V. Yes, yeah, sorry. So this choice of V is precisely the same choice of V as previously. So we're still in a 0-1 polyhedron. We're still at a, a vertex solution of a 0-1 LP. So the same choice of V as last time. Um, is perfectly well defined. So we really did. Uh, we took uh, we took the LP from last time, um, which depended on our current uh, vertex solution, and we just took the feasible cone out and put in the basic cone. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. I had meant to say that. Um, so this definition can be uh, implemented on a tableau. Uh, it isn't necessary to define it in terms of of this LP. I defined defined it this way for this talk to demonstrate the parity between what's happening here and, and what's happening in the circuit and edge setting. Um, and also because that is, this is where the idea for this rule came from. You know, what happened? Can we make this a pivot rule by just using the basic cone instead? Um, but of course there are only dimension many uh, you know, pivot directions. So we can just say of them, which one do I pick? Um, so this leaves some open questions. Uh, so can we bound the number of degenerate pivots taken by this pivot rule? Um, and, and, and perhaps more realistically, maybe for certain subclasses of 0-1 LPs, since that question is quite hard in general. Um, can we achieve similar or related results for uh, classes of LPs other than 0-1? So an obvious candidate would be uh, lattice polytopes, um, but we do know that our precise techniques um, and methods don't translate automatically to that case. Um, so it would require some extra insights and work in order to get that to work, um, but that would be nice. Um, and can we achieve similar results on 0-1 LPs, uh, but 
inspired by other classical pivot rules. So this one um, sort of inspired by, uh, you know, the classical steepest descent pivot rule, what Alex talked about before me, inspired by the shadow vertex pivot rule. Um, it'd be nice if, uh, if there were other classical pivot rules uh, for which we could do something similar. Um, okay, thank you. That's all I have to say.